Uh, actually, thanks for giving me an opportunity to present today. Uh, uh, today, my presentation is about uh, edge of propagation modes using machine learning guided by ray tracing. Uh, I'm a, basically, I'm a research faculty working for the Superdan group at Virginia Tech. So I'm going to be talking a lot about the uh, Superdan radars and edge of propagation, uh, the frequencies at which they operate in and the types of challenges that we encounter uh, with these radars and uh, the data. So for those of you who are not familiar with Superdan, uh, it basically stands for Super Dual Aurora Radar Network. It's an international network of high frequency space weather radars. Uh, and if you've used the data before, the most commonly used data product are global maps of ionospheric convection patterns. Uh, and there's a bunch of radars. I think there's about 30 to 35 radars uh, that are spread across the world uh, right now operating in both the hemispheres. So we combine data from all these radars and generate one uh, common global output of ionospheric plasma convection in the uh, uh, or output of ionospheric plasma convection. And the principal backscatter targets for our radars are plasma irregularities, uh, uh, which are in the decameter spatial scales in the upper atmosphere. And some of the key operating characteristics of a super down radar are that we operate at the frequencies, like I said before. It's uh, usually our typical operational frequencies are between nine and 18 megahertz. We transmit 10 kilowatts of peak power, so we are pretty cheap to operate. So we operate 24 seven, 365 days a year, uh, unless there's some maintenance issue or some other problem going on. And uh, we used a phased array to steer uh, in 16 to 24 beam directions. And typically the range resolution is about 45 kilometers and we have a one to two minute temporal resolution. The a typical field of view of super down radar is shown in this plot. And uh, in this plot, we are dwelling on a particular beam for about a few seconds. And then we, we scan across uh, 16 to 24 beams in about one to two minutes. And uh, that's our typical temporal resolution. But we operate in special mode. Sometimes we can get lower uh, range resolution and sometimes we can get higher temporal resolution uh, depending on the requirement. But these are the most typical operational characteristics. Uh, like I said before, the <clears throat> all the radars produce uh, uh, identical data products and uh, we combine them to produce a global map of uh, anospheric plasma convection. That's one of the products. There are several other products depending on uh, uh, your requirements. Uh, so I was talking. Uh, about Superdan being a global uh, uh, network. And uh, in, this in this slide, I'm showing different uh, radars that are spread across the globe. Uh, continental US, I'm starting at mid latitudes. We cover the mid latitude region. Uh, I'm talking about 50 degrees magnetic latitude and above. Uh, we also cover the high latitude region and also the polar cap region. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, MI coupling uh, uh, terminology. And uh, similarly, in the Southern Hemisphere, we have a few radars in the Australian sector. There's one in Falkland Islands that covers the uh, mid latitude uh, region, and there's a few spread across the Antarctic continent that cover the high latitude and the polar cap region. Uh, but basically, my focus is going to be on the mid latitude regions, and I'm going to focus on one of the radars that is uh, operated by our colleagues at the Dartmouth College in Oregon. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, we have radar spread across the world, like I said before, uh, starting from Wallops Island on the East Coast in Virginia to uh, Oregon on the West Coast. We have a couple in Kansas, and uh, there's a bunch more coming up in the Asian sectors. And some of our Chinese, Chinese colleagues are constructing about what, six, six radars now. So uh, there's a lot more radars popping up. So a quick summary about HF uh, radar and the different backscatter modes. Uh, I was talking about Superdan being operated in HF frequencies and our most typical frequency range of operation is between nine and 18 megahertz. And one of the key characteristics of uh, operating in the high frequency range is that uh, these rays bend or refract when they enter the ionosphere uh, or the upper uh, Earth's upper atmosphere, which is the charged region. And uh, we use it to our end advantage in some cases where, uh, for example, when these rays refract in such a manner that they are perpendicular to the background magnetic field, we can bounce off of plasma irregularities in the F region of the ionosphere, uh, typically above uh, at heights greater than 150 kilometers in altitude. Uh, and a key byproduct of uh, edge of propagation is that some of these rays bend or refract to such an extent that they uh, you know, move towards the ground and we get reflections back from the ground. I mean, this data product could be used for some other uh, purposes. I'm not getting into that details now, it's irrelevant to this presentation, but uh, that's a key byproduct of this uh, 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 frequency range. So your rays can either become perpendicular or one of the propagation modes is that they are perpendicular to the background magnetic field and they bounce off of irregularities, uh, uh, field aligned irregularities. <clears throat> 
And the other uh, is that they can bend to such an extent that they bounce off of the ground and reflect from ground or sea uh, or oceans. And usually we call this one hop ground scatter. And uh, the first reflection from the ionosphere is usually called half hop ionospheric scatter. And sometimes uh, this one hop ground scatter traverses even further in range and we can get reflections from uh, you know, farther in range. Uh, that could be one and a half hop ionospheric scatter or you know, it could further bend down and you could see two hop ground scatter. And in some cases you could see three hops and you know, two and a half hops. It can... So basically the concept is that it can propagate really long distances. These are called over the horizon radars for, all, for that reason. And uh, HF propagation, uh, like you can see, is a little complicated for that matter. So this shows a typical data product of uh, Superdome. This is a single beam time series. I'm taking this from one of the high latitude radars. Uh, I think it's located in Caps Casing in Canada. I'm showing three uh, uh, specific uh, 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 parameters. I'm showing the power, I'm showing the Doppler velocity, and I'm showing the spectral width. So uh, if you look at the Doppler velocity, uh, you can see that the ionospheric half hop and one and a half hop ionospheric backscatter has really high velocities uh, reaching a few hundred meters per second. And the ground scatter here is shown in gray color, but uh, it's usually, you know, ground's not moving. So it's usually a few meters per second and uh, to a, a, and it can range up to a few tens of meters per second, depending on the motion of the ionospheric layers. But the key differentiating factor between uh, uh, ground scatter and ionospheric scatter is that uh, ionospheric scatter moves at uh, really large velocities. It can reach a few kilometers per second. Uh, and even the spectral width for that matter. Spectral width uh, is a parameter that we measure that gives us information about the nature of the irregularities or the backscatter we're bouncing off of. But one of the key differentiating factors, at least at high latitudes uh, between ionospheric and ground scatter is that uh, spectral width for ground scatter is low and spectral width for ionospheric scatter is typically high at high latitudes. So it's usually easier to uh, distinguish between ground scatter and ionospheric scatter and we can make measurements at least at high latitudes. So the original chain of Superdown was initially built around the 60 degrees magnetic latitude region. Uh, most of these radars were spread across the you know, uh, North American continent. Uh, but then uh, they, they provided key information about you know, ionospheric plasma dynamics uh, you know, during quite to moderately disturbed conditions. But when you know, there was a major geomagnetic storm going on and when uh, the aurora level was expanded to such an extent that it was uh, reaching below 60 degrees magnetic latitude, uh, our radars uh, could not provide a complete coverage of ionospheric electrodynamics uh, in such a scenario. So a new chain of mid-latitude radars was built uh, starting in 2005. The first of the radars was built in uh, Wallops Island in Virginia. Uh, and uh, it was built in August 2000. It came operational in August 2005, uh, if I recall the dates correctly. <clears throat> and it started making measurements of uh, providing very useful information about uion ionospheric electrodynamics during, uh, you know, these major geomagnetic storms or during uh, uh, intervals when there was uh, a severe geomagnetic activity going on. And uh, that shows an example here. So. It was all great uh, when the geomagnetic activity was, uh, you know, all pumped up and uh, there was a storm going on. But one of the things that we noticed when we started operating these mid-latitude radars is that there is very little difference between ionospheric and ground scatter. 70% of the time on the night side, our radars started observing this really slow moving ionospheric scatter. So it was completely different from what we've seen at high latitudes. The scatter was very slow. The spectral width was slow. And so our traditional algorithm, which was designed based on velocity and spectral width uh, parameters to distinguish between ground scatter and ionospheric scatter. I mean, please recall that this was developed for high latitudes. And when we started using it for mid latitudes, it, it, uh, its performance went down drastically. It, it failed to, or it failed to identify a significant amount of ionospheric scatter and misclassified it as uh, ground scatter. And when we compared our data with other instruments like uh, incoherent scatter radars, we noticed that we were you know, overestimating ionospheric scatter by about 2x because you know, we were discarding all these low velocity data points. So to overcome that problem, I'm showing an example here actually from uh, one of the earlier papers that uh, was working on this problem. This is from uh, Ribeiro 2011. Uh, uh, this came out of a group back in 2011. And uh, this shows one of the examples where most of this ionospheric scatter was being misclassified as ground scatter by our traditional algorithm. Uh, 
and there's a, a few other uh, uh, parameters that you can see. There's a, a reflections coming from meteor echoes and all that parameters, but I'll talk about those in the next few slides. But uh, to overcome this problem, uh, the author came up with a slightly different approach. So instead of, so pre our previous algorithm was using each individual backscatter point and then trying to come up with thresholding level for velocity and uh, spectral width, and it was classifying it either as ionospheric and ground scatter. So the author then decided, you know, instead of analyzing, you know, uh, individual backscatter points, uh, he decided to analyze a cluster or a group of large uh, backscatter points. So he combined uh, uh, extended time, uh, uh, backscatter over extended time series intervals, and then he started analyzing the characteristics of the groups. And uh, he showed that it was performing better, but there were some other shortcomings. For example, uh, it could not be applied in real time. It only worked over extended multi-hour uh, backscatter points. It, it failed to distinguish uh, between ionospheric scatter when there was uh, a scatter that did not uh, span over multiple hours. And another problem or another uh, issue we had was that there was contamination between ionospheric and ground scatter. I'll show some examples in the next few slides. And uh, what we typically want to measure is backscatter above 150 kilometers or 200 kilometers in the F region. And sometimes we can have contamination from the E region of the ionosphere, which is below the 150 kilometers range. So all these uh, problems were uh, uh, you know, evident when we uh, uh, started working with this uh, new set of data. So, like I mentioned before, most of the uh, 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 people who analyzed ionospheric and ground scatter relied on data and they relied on two specific parameters, uh, velocity and spectral width. And uh, oftentimes a very useful tool that is not used in this analysis is ray tracing. Uh, in really simple terms, ray tracing is nothing but the application of Snell's law to determine uh, the direction a ray propagates in uh, the Earth's atmosphere. And in this case, I'm showing ray tracing along a beam for the Christmas Valley radar that's located in Oregon. Uh, this is beam 11 that's highlighted in the, uh, for the Christmas Valley radar. And I'm ray tracing uh, using IRI 2016 uh, uh, ionosphere. And Basically, the idea is to launch a bunch of rays between five and 55 degrees elevation angle. So the elevation angle is uh, shown here. It's basically from the ground. Uh, it, this is the typical elevation angles that we operate in. And uh, as the ray progresses in the ionosphere and we move uh, along the range, we try to identify if the aspect conditions or if the rays are uh, perpendicular to the background magnetic field. And if they are, then we try to uh, this, uh, uh, assign that region as a region which is uh, which can uh, observe ionospheric scatter. And there is also another is useful information about uh, the ranges where you can observe ground scatter. In this case, uh, ground scatter is expected to observe uh, to be observed after 750 kilometers for this particular given uh, for this particular time. Uh, please note that uh, the ionosphere varies with season. Uh, uh, there are diagonal variations in the ionosphere. So it's all uh, dependent on a bunch of other factors too. So uh, the ionosphere is an important component of this analysis. But basically uh, the idea is that uh, ray tracing can give you crucial information about the likelihood of observing a certain set of backscatter given the frequency of operation, given the ionospheric conditions, given the time, given the month. So it was a great tool that could be used in our analysis to distinguish between ionospheric uh, and ground scatter and also identify you know, modes of mixed scatter. So for example, if you can look here, uh, if you look at uh, you know, maybe 1200 to 1300 kilometers range, you can see that there is a significant certain race of certain elevation can reach the ground and race of certain other elevation can observe uh, one and a half of ionospheric scatter. So there is potential for contamination here. And uh, ideally, if we are combining data to develop uh, global convection patterns, we'd want to discard these points or we'd want to reanalyze points where uh, there is contamination between ground scatter and uh, ionospheric scatter. So that was one of the goals here. But the problem with ray tracing is that it's slow, it's often difficult to implement, and uh, it cannot be applied. And uh, as a result, it cannot be applied on statistical scales or uh, you know, in, for real-time operations. So to overcome that problem, we, uh, what we did is we generated a synthetic data set of ray tracing simulations. So our goal was to uh, you know, use uh, ray tracing simulations and train a neural network, which is significantly faster uh, to mimic ray tracing. So we uh, 
uh, we developed a bunch of synthetic, uh, synthetic ray tracing simulations to identify the probability of observing a certain type of backscatter given a set of conditions uh, that is uh, season, uh, hour, you know, uh, distance and frequency of operation. Uh, we generated these simulations and uh, we trained a neural network to mimic ray tracing. Uh, so that way we could overcome some of the problems associated with uh, the computational complexities of ray tracing. So this shows the model architecture. The first part is the ray tracing, the neural network that was used to uh, simulate ray tracing, uh, uh, like I mentioned before. And the second part talks about uh, distinguishing between ionospheric and ground scatter. So uh, the inputs to the neural network are basically uh, representative of the inputs that go into ray tracing. Uh, for example, AP and F10.7 indices are used to uh, drive the IRI ionosphere. Uh, and then there is the range, uh, frequency, month, and uh, hour, and so on and so on. Uh, and the output has two different uh, uh, layers. The first layer is a classification layer, uh, which gives out the probability of identifying different types of backscatter. Please note that there is ionospheric and ground, and there is also different hops. There is half hop, one and a half hop, two hop, and one hop ground. And depending on the reflection height of the backscatter, we're also dividing between or distinguishing between E region and F region. For the purpose of this paper, we're uh, talking about uh, anything below any reflection below 150, uh, 150 kilometers of altitude is classified as E region and anything about 150 is classified as F region because we ideally want uh, reflections from the F region. And there is a regression layer. I'll talk about the utility of the regression layer in the later slides, uh, but basically uh, 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 the regression layer gives you certain parameters that are associated with ray tracing like the elevation angles. So for example, if you're trying to observe, uh, if you're observing ionospheric scatter at a particular point, the regression layer is going to give out the elevation angle associated with that particular point. Also note that this is a multi-class classification problem as in uh, you could have equal likelihood of observing uh, ionospheric scatter and ground scatter at a given range so as I showed in the previous example. So anyways, the goal then, the second step of this algorithm then takes the probabilities of these different classes of backscatter, combines them with the actual measurements of velocity, spectral width, uh, and the time, and um, it spits out clusters of backscatter. And our goal is to identify whether this cluster belongs to a certain category of backscatter or whether there is contamination from uh, between ground and ionospheric scatter and so on and so on. So, Straight away, I'll jump, jump into, actually, I, I skipped the validation part of the neural network. Uh, I'm not going to spend time on it at this point, but uh, uh, we had a truth table uh, about true, true positives and false positives. And not surprisingly, the neural network did pretty well uh, in uh, classifying, you know, uh, different categories of backscatter. That's because, you know, you're basically training the neural network on a bunch of simulations, which are pretty clean. So that's not the right way to validate it. So I'll not spend my time on it. Uh, I'll talk about a different way of validating our work in the next few slides, but I'm starting with an example uh, of our model predictions. The top slide is actual data from the beam level of Christmas Valley West radar. Uh, it's about, it's, it's showing the line of sight velocities. Uh, they're not strong. They're about a few tens of meters per second. And, uh, these, uh, 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 this is showing the entire day of data. And in the middle panel, I'm showing a simplified output of the neural network. Uh, obviously, as I showed before, uh, the network can further subdivide the data into different categories based on hops and altitudes of reflection and so on and so on. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm just talking about ionospheric and ground in this case. I'm just labeling it as ionospheric and ground. So uh, what it tells you is that on the day side, uh, uh, based on the UTR, if you translate UTR into local time, uh, this region is day side. On the day side, you predominantly observe uh, ground scatter, and on the night side, you predominantly observe uh, ionospheric scatter. If you follow physics in a very fundamental sense, uh, that makes sense because on the day side, the ionospheric is very strong uh, or very dense, and uh, the rays are refracted to a greater extent, and there is a higher likelihood of uh, observing ground scatter. And on the night side, uh, there is a higher likelihood of uh, observing ionospheric scatter. I mean, you're using ray tracing to do that, and that makes uh, sense. And it agrees with some of the previous statistical studies that have uh, done this analysis. And uh, in the second step, I'm combining the neural network output with uh, actual real data parameters, and then uh, using DB scan clustering to uh, uh, provide clusters of different uh, 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 clusters of this data. And uh, what you can see is uh, there's a bunch of outliers indicated by uh, the black dots and it takes out features like the, the small scale features, which 
may or may not be coming from uh, the ionosphere, uh, those are being taken away. Uh, those are taken away in the second category uh, after the clustering algorithm. That's one of the advantages of clustering algorithm. Another reason that we use the second step of clustering is because sometimes there is really high velocity uh, backscatter and that, that's misclassified because uh, ray tracing and the IRI ionosphere get less and less reliable when uh, geomagnetic conditions are disturbed, but that's not the problem here. But uh, that is also uh, taken care of uh, by the uh, second stage of clustering, which is combining ray tracing results with, uh, or the neural network results with uh, actual data. So you have different sets of clusters now, and I'm going to briefly talk about uh, the different parameters that are going into these clusters uh, that are you know, uh, that are part of these clusters. Uh, there are, I'm not presenting all the parameters that are, I mean, due to the lack of space, but uh, I'm, I'm only going to show you a few parameters that uh, uh, form these clusters. So for example, I'm showing the actual data here, which is line of sight velocities and spectral width. And the key takeaway here is that, you know, there's, there isn't a significant difference between all these different clusters. So if you're just basing your analysis to on uh, velocity and spectral width or actual data to distinguish between these categories, then uh, yeah, it's, it's really difficult to do that because the distributions are very similar uh, a majority of the time. I mean, notice the scales here. This, this is about 50 to uh, minus 50 meters per second. And the spectral width characteristics are also very similar. So it's really difficult uh, to distinguish between these different uh, categories of backscatter just based on data. So the key differentiating factor, at least in this case, is coming from the probabilities of uh, probabilities predicted by the neural network, uh, which are mimicking ray tracing. So uh, it's clearly calling certain class of classes as a half hop E region ionospheric, and there are a few which are half of half hop F region ionospheric. There's a few which are you know uh, uh, one hop ground and a half hop F region uh, ionospheric. So what I did now is I took the dominant, if there is no significant difference between the velocity and spectral width, I can take the dominant uh, probability in a certain cluster and then classify them into different categories. So this is the same event. Uh, I'm not classifying uh, 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 the data into different uh, uh, categories based on the probabilities or the dominant probability in that category. So uh, you can straight away watch that on the day side, it's mostly significantly uh, one half F region. There is a few regions where uh, there is contamination between uh, F region and uh, or possible contamination between uh, one and a half of F region and one half ground. And on the day side again here, uh, you see uh, ground scatter. And on the night side, uh, most of this is coming from half of F region ionospheric. Uh, there's a few regions where the ray tracing could not identify what the scatter was, and there's a reason for this. Uh, it is because we are going beyond two hops. We are going very far in range. This is uh, about 60th range gate, and uh, that's more than, I, think, uh, I don't recall the uh, 16th part. It's, it's more than 2,000 kilometers, I think, in range. So uh, we had not, for the sake of simplicity, we didn't ray trace beyond 2,000 kilometers, so it could not identify what the category was, and that's basically... Uh, uh, categorized as no scatter. And in the near ranges, uh, we are calling a certain set of scatter. Uh, it, it failed to identify a certain set of scatter. That's because these are coming from meteor echoes uh, and you cannot ray trace this. So uh, these near range echoes are actually meteor echoes. And the algorithm provides you a way to distinguish between these uh, different types of near range echoes. Some of these near range echoes are coming from meteor echo meteor trails, and some of these are coming from the lower altitude reflections in the half of E region. So this is basically uh, one of the examples. So I was talking about validation in the uh, previous uh, uh, slides. Uh, a better way to validate our model would be to compare elevation angles. So I'm using some of the parameters that the regression layer predicted to validate the model. So I talked about how certain uh, rays launched at a uh, how rays launched at a certain elevation angles could reach uh, ionospheric scatter or certain rays could reach ground scatter uh, at a given range. Uh, we also measure, some of the radars actually measure the elevation angles. So, and uh, Christmas Valley West is one of those radars. And what we did is if our uh, theory about if the HF propagation theory or the physics behind HF propagation is right, uh, the predicted elevation angles should match up with the measured elevation angle. So if it's expecting a certain type of backscatter at a given location, uh, the elevation angle uh, should be the same between the measurements and the predictions. And in a qualitative sense here, I'm showing the same beam 
uh, but I'm comparing elevation angles here. And the top panel is showing the measured elevation angles and the bottom panel is showing the predicted elevation angles. And as you can see, uh, qualitatively, they look very similar. Uh, they're about 25 degrees uh, ish. Uh, uh, for the ground scatter and uh, for the anospheric scatter, you can start seeing certain smaller differences. I'll talk about quantifying them uh, right now, actually. So overall, there is a median error of about three degrees uh, in elevation angles. And there is another systematic uh, pattern that you see with the elevation angles here. Uh, basically, you would see that, for, for example, for the ground scatter uh, in this region, you would see that in the near ranges, the elevation angles are uh, overestimated. This is the difference between predicted and measured elevation angles, by the way. Uh, in the near ranges, the predictions overestimate the uh, uh, measurements, and in the farther ranges, the predictions underestimate uh, or the trend reverses and uh, the predictions are underestimated. And now the key question is what's driving these differences, right? And uh, what does this mean for some of the assumptions I made? And one of the key assumptions that I made uh, with my analysis is that the IRI atmosphere that I'm ray tracing through is uh, accurate. And that's one of the major contributions are accurate for my purposes. It's basically a statistical average over an entire month. So would it be useful in ray tracing is a, a key question here. So what we did then is try to change the IRI ionosphere in such a way that, that uh, it matches up or uh, try to change different parameters of the IRI ionosphere to match what's happening with edge of propagation. So, here, it's a, what we're showing is an elevation angle as a function of range for different variations in one of the parameters of uh, uh, IRI. So we tried it for a different set of parameters. I'm choosing NMF2 because uh, 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 this is one of the key contributors to edge of propagation. Uh, but what you can take away from this slide is that uh, a 15 to 30% uh, difference in NMF2 can drive a three, two to five degrees difference in elevation angle. Uh, that, uh, so, that means uh, my initial estimate about uh, the IR ionosphere here is likely off by about 15 to 30%. So uh, this brings me to an important point about the modeling approach that we choose. Uh, we combine some theory with uh, our data and the differences between what the theory tells me and what the data shows me can be used to quantify or identify, you know, if I may call it uncertainty uh, in the uh, uh, IR ionosphere. So if there is a significant difference between the uh, elevation angle measurements, I can use it to quantify uh, the IR ionosphere. And if there isn't a significant difference, we can assume that for the purpose, or at least on that particular day, the IR, uh, ionosphere is uh, well estimated by IRI. And, uh, uh, our, uh, our predictions are uh, very accurate. Uh, but you know, the model serves two purposes. One is quantify the uncertainties in uh, the initial uh, uh, ionosphere. Uh, and then uh, you can also use it to uh, classify between different scatter modes. Uh, I forgot to so, mention- Barat, um, yes. if you could wrap up in about a minute, that would be nice. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, I didn't realize I was going over. No, that. no, that's anyway, fine. Uh, maybe I'll just quickly summarize. So I was talking about uh, a uh, so we also noticed a seasonal trend, and uh, we noticed that uh, the errors were highest in about in summer, and the reason for that is that uh, IRI cannot express things like sporadic ease, which are higher in summer, and uh, that's another reason that we uh, find a higher error in summer and lower error in winter. Uh, we did some statistics and uh, uh, our method showed significant improvement over the traditional method. And uh, uh, we found a significant increase in the number of backscatter points and including these newer backscatter points brings us in closer agreement with uh, other uh, instruments, uh, measurements from other instruments. So I'll, I'll conclude there. I'll leave the conclusion slides. I'm sorry for going over time.